We're going to continue with electrophilic addition, and we're uh, now looking at different molecules to add across this double bond. So here's our alkene nucleophile. Now, if you think about what we've learned so far, we've always had a um, definitive dipole. We've had like H, X, where X is a halogen, chlorine or bromine usually, or it could be iodine, or we had H3O+. Plus. which is also pretty electrophilic right here at these hydrogens, okay? So the dipole was like this, right? Well, now we're looking at things that are more nonpolar, like Cl2 or Br2. Now the thing is, we know that as nonpolar molecules, that these exhibit attractions to each other through um, London dispersion forces. So those are sort of the nonpolar attractive forces. And how, how those work is that uh, these nonpolar molecules, even though we think of the electron density being pretty even across this molecule, at any given time, it's possible that there are these fluctuations in electron density. They're very transient. They're, very, they're not permanent dipoles. But at any given moment, the electrons might slosh over to this side or might slosh over to that side. And that creates then a temporary dipole. And those dipoles can then induce dipoles in neighboring molecules, and then those weak attractions can add up. So when we look at bromine here, uh, it's got, let's say, a temporary dipole. So this can help us think of it like all the other reactions we've learned so far. So we bounce these over to here, grab that bromine, and then release this one. Now, just like we saw with oxymercuration, bromine is pretty large, so it's got lone pairs as well. So instead of just forming a positive charge at this carbon, what do you think might happen because bromine is polarizable and large? And think back to oxymercuration. What do we see with the mercury? Well, at this stage, we saw the mercury use some of its electron density to stabilize this molecule and prevent the carbocation from forming. So I'm going to show that here. So instead of a positive charge developing on this carbon, I'm going to help to neutralize that by forming a bridged intermediate. So see, I'm going to form a bridge right here. And then this guy is going to dissociate. So let's draw that in. So that puts a positive charge on my bromonium ion. Okay, so that's the bridge intermediate here. And then I've got my bromide ion that has dissociated. And at this point, I think you know now who the nucleophile is likely to be. Is it going to be these carbons, the bromonium ion here, or the bromide ion here? Well, I think you guys know nucleophile are the negatively charged species usually. So this has an option to attack. Now, the thing is, if we attack the bromide, then we're going to go backwards. So we don't want to make Br2. We want the bromine here to stay on this molecule. We just want to release some of this ring strain here. So I'm going to think about the bromine as being positive and putting some partial positive then on these carbons right here. So this might remind you then of the mechanism we did just last time. So that should remind you of the mercurium ion bridge that we saw before in the oxymercuration reaction from last time. So we have the nucleophile coming in at the secondary rather than the primary carbon, the more substituted one then leading to a more stable transition state, which then will likely have a lower activation energy. So that attack here will be faster than the attack here. So I'm going to show that right here. Now notice I'm not coming in from the top because of steric hindrance here. I'm going to come in from the bottom. So when I attack from the bottom, I'm going to release this bromine from the bridge up at the top. So here's that bromine that was already on there. And then the bromine that I just attacked with is down here. And so notice this is going to be called anti-addition because I'm attacking one bromine from the opposite side of the other bromine. Now, because of bond rotations, I'm not really going to be able to preserve that anti-relationship. But that's basically what I get. Now, so this box is sort of extra. I didn't mean to put that there. This is your final product. 
So overall, what we did was we took a double bond and we added bromine to each of the carbons of the double bond. All right, now let's take a look at what happens if we use a protic solvent. So you might know that protic solvents are going to be involved uh, in attacking uh, the carbocation or the carbocation like intermediate. So let's take a look up here. We had methylene chloride or diethyl ether. Okay, so these are aprotic solvents. So they help to dissolve everything together and they help to stabilize charged intermediates, but they're not going to be attacking because they won't be able to get neutralized. So now let's take a look over here. If we had something like water where a proton can dissociate, then we got something that can be neutralized if it attacks. So let's do the same kind of thing we did before. Why don't you guys practice that? So go ahead and attack here, release, and then attack back and form your bridged intermediate. Okay, now you guys see that we have a competition here. We've got two possible nucleophiles, the solvent and the bromide ion that just, just associated. So do you know which one might attack? If you look back at the reaction we covered before, remember I said that even though the acetate is going to be more basic, there's so much water around and sufficiently basic to attack. And so their likelihood of water attacking is just much greater. So let's use that concept. I'm going to use water. I'm going to attack. Again, this is based on positive charged environment here. So when, we're, when we are looking at electronic factors based on positive charge, we usually attack the more substituted carbon over here. Again, that's because that transition state is more stable. All right, so let's open up this bridge and then show what we get. And let's show anti-addition if possible. Because remember, anytime you have a bridged intermediate, we see anti-addition as the nucleophile comes in opposite to where the bridge is. So instead of coming in the top, we come in from the opposite side. And then after we have that, I think you guys can see this isn't quite stable yet, so we've got to neutralize it. So whenever you neutralize it, bring in some kind of base in solution. In our case, we've got another water molecule. All right, there we go. So we've got what we call a halo hydrin. So instead of a dihalide, which we got before, and let's label that. This is a dihalide because there's two halogens. We've got the addition of a halogen and water. So this is a halo hydrin. So the product would be um, a halo hydrin if we have water as the solvent. But this next question asks, what would happen if we used something similar but not the same? How about methanol? So this is also protic, correct? Do you guys know how this mechanism would change then and how would this final product change? So just replace every place there's water with a CH3H, uh, CH3OH. So I will make one of these a CH3 group, and then I'll follow it through here, and I'll make this a CH3 group. And so that ends up making a CH3 over here. Okay, so that's going to make, instead of an alcohol, it's going to make an ether. And I want you guys to note that this idea of using a different solvent than water uh, can make ethers that um, we've seen in other places as well. So for example, let's look at uh, oxymercuration here, okay? We used water and added water. So there, again, we can have an ether here instead, right? So uh, if we use methanol or ethanol, we'll have an ethyl or methyl ether here. Uh, another reaction that we've seen, how about this one? So instead of water here, we, we have acid to catalyze, but we use uh, methanol or ethanol again. So that's going to add um, an OR group, an alkyl group here instead of a hydrogen. So just be aware that the solvent, especially when it's protic, will affect what product you get. Now the last part of this is to look at the stereochemistry. We've talked about anti-addition here. So how do we know that? Um, because you can lose anti here. Once this starts rotating, you can see that the OCH3 could be on the same side as the bromide, right? So they could be eclipsed or staggered and on the same side. So how do we know that they added anti? Well, the evidence for that comes from when we study rings. So when we have bromide attack, or this pi bond attack the bromine, 
Um, let's look at the bridged intermediate that forms. So let's practice our mechanism here. So I would do attack and release and then attack back. And so it's going to be really critical for you guys when you're um, working on this that you know the difference between when you do that attack back and when you don't. Okay, so when do you make a bridged intermediate and when do you not? So that's something you might want to look at in all of these reactions is delineating which ones go through this and which ones just form a carbocation instead. All right, now I'm picking one face of this. Um, so I, with the cyclohexene, I'm putting it on its side now. So just did a slight rotation. And now I have a top side and a bottom side. So with equal probability, you could have bromide, a bromonium ion up here, or you could have the bridged bromonium ion down here. Okay, so either way, I like to show it on top. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't matter though. And, and then uh, we, we see that the bromide can come in either from the top or it can come in from the bottom. So just two possibilities. If it came in from the top, then we would see syndibromide, right? We would see cis. But we don't see that. Actually, experimental evidence shows that trans is the only product. And it happens to be chiral here, by the way. A lot of these um, could be chiral, in which case you have equal, um, a racemic mixture usually of the enantiomers. So because we see trans only, that tells us that we have anti-addition. Okay, whereas, like I said, if we had syn addition and this came in from the top, okay, then we would have cis and we see that that doesn't happen. So particularly with rings, you guys, I want to make sure that you definitely show the stereochemistry as being anti. So now that we've covered some more reactions, let's go back to our summary page that we were making and I was telling you about making flashcards before. And then we wrote out the mechanism or step-by-step -step process for our first reaction that we learned. So you should be doing this, you know, getting a sheet of paper out, writing a reaction out with the mechanism and all the arrows and showing all the intermediates and including colors if you can or what notes you can make for yourself on the rationale of each step. So the dipole here and this is their nucleophile and things like that help you to figure out, you know, carbocations, they can rearrange. So making little notes to yourself like that, or even incorporating examples of a carbocation rearrangement will help you to look for those things. The next reaction we learned was hydration, and we used acid to catalyze the reaction. So you can actually use H2SO4 or HX, like HCl or HBr, in small quantities just to catalyze the reaction. You actually are going to use water as the nucleophile, though. So uh, I want you to first take a moment and think back to hydration and think about what you were adding to the pi bond, what groups are going to be added to these carbons, and then is it going to be Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? So think about what the product should be here. And I think for bonus, why don't you think about the mechanism as well, like how, what goes on here, and that will help lead you to the correct product as well. Go ahead and try both those things. Try figuring out what this is going to be here at the end, and then do a mechanism and see if you're right. Go ahead and pause it. All right, guys, it turns out that the alcohol is actually going to be on here. It's not even one of the original carbons. So do you know, do you know why that is? Turns out that there's a carbocation that would form here at the secondary position, and then we'd have a hydride shift to get to tertiary. This reaction involves carbocations. It's generally Markovnikov addition, except you can't see that sometimes when the carbocation rearranges. Still considered Markovnikov, however. So the uh, best thing to do here, I think, is to do your first step. Think of the carbocation that forms and then you'll get rearrangement, and then you'll get addition, and then you'll get deprotonation, and you should end up here. So when you do the mechanism, I want you to think about including those arrows which tell us what's going on here. So H plus is, is taken off of here, and then we have a carbocation, draw what those are, and show the water attacking it. After the rearrangement, water attacks deprotonation. So you should be familiar with all those steps now. Now for the next reaction, we want to look at oxymercuration. 
and ask the same questions. Across this double bond, what groups are we adding? And is this Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? We also want to think about, is there carbocation or is it a bridged intermediate? What kind of mechanism does this undergo? So take a moment and predict the product and then work through a mechanism that gets you to that product. Go ahead and pause it now. All right, guys, hopefully you recognize that the um, reaction goes through a bridge intermediate and it's the water that attacks. So this is going to be added Markovnikov. And it turns out that it is uh, not through a carbocation intermediate and it's actually through a bridge which prevents carbocations from forming. So we don't have carbocation rearrangements. So there is no need to put an OH group over here. It's going to be on this double bond. And that's the purpose of using this reaction over this one is to be able to avoid those carbocation rearrangements. All right, so this is a long mechanism, so you better go through a bridge. So I'll start you off here if you didn't already. We bounce to here, we grab that mercury, we release one of the acetates, and we come back and attack. That's all the first step, okay? So then that's going to give you a bridged intermediate here, and then that's going to give you the water attacking, and then the water gets... Um, Water comes in and neutralizes that. And then we have um, mercury still on there. So we got to show the mercury coming off with NADH4. So you guys fill all this in, okay? And draw, draw out all the arrows, just like we went through in the activity together. Now I want to demonstrate the two reactions we just learned today, which is the bromine, addition of bromine. I'm going to, again, use an asymmetric alkene, so different substitution patterns there. And I'm going to show different colors. So I've got, got Br2 or X2. It could be Cl2 as well, right? So, or I2, okay? So I want you to show the product here. What is the correct stereoisomer of the product? Is it cis or trans? Now for me, I sort of forget sometimes, how do I just know what to get here? And so that's where the mechanism comes in for me. I'm picturing something like this, and then this comes back, and then I have Br2 bridge, and then the other Br comes in at the more substituted. So I'm, I'm picturing something like this comes about after that entire mechanism. I've sort of worked out the mechanism and I have certain triggers. Like if I see this, then I know there's a bridge and then I know the other one comes in and attacks here. So I can figure this out. So I'd like you to be able to do things like that. So this is going to be trans dihalide, and then I'm going to have its enantiomer as well. So that means I'm going to have the reversed or inverse stereochemistry at each of these carbons. So I'd like you to show the mechanism like I did here and show the bridged intermediate that you get and show the attack opening it up. And this one was done in a protic solvent. So I'm just going to write that in here. If it's omitted, that means it's already a protic. But if you are not a protic, it needs to be shown. So I would do another reaction where I show what happens in a protic solvent such as water. So again, I'll use Br2, or it's good to draw it out actually, because it's nice to break those bonds. So you show Br2 and then in a different color, show something like water or alcohol. Now in this case, it's a little trickier because do we add the Br to the more substituted carbon or the OH to the more substituted carbon? And again, why don't you guys try to figure that out by thinking about the mechanism and then see if the mechanism leads you to the correct answer. So it turns out that the um, reaction goes this way, right? And it comes back and we get the bromonium ion and then water later will come in and attack here. So I know that water is going to be OH, oh, wrong color. Water is going to be OH here and then my bromine is going to be over here. So it's actually Markovnikov with respect to the water. So again, show your mechanism, first step, and then draw out the cyclic intermediate here. Then water is going to attack, and then water is going to get neutralized. Um, and actually, that's going to be it. And then when you guys have all of these mechanisms filled in for all the reactions we've learned, uh, then you'll have a nice review sheet for your exams.